The following may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Twenty-one-year-old woman dies in accident along the southern main road. A twenty-one-year-old woman who was returning home after liming with friends was erased in a motor vehicle accident in Cedros on Saturday. The victim has been identified as Shireen Sherwood, a mother of one of Southern Main Road, Cedros. Sherwood received significant injuries and died at the scene. The accident occurred around 2:30 a.m. along the Southern Main Road, in close proximity to the Perseverance Estate. The driver, Sherwood's cousin, was taken to her home, which was about 20 minutes away from where the accident occurred. A police report stated that the vehicle got out of control, careened off the roadway, flipped several times, and slammed into a coconut tree. The driver has been hospitalized at the San Fernando General Hospital. A relative of Sherwood, who requested anonymity, said Sherwood lived with her 67-year-old father, while her four-year-old daughter lived with her eldest sister. She explained that Sherwood. Went with her boyfriend and friends to Ikakas on Friday to lime because it was her boyfriend's birthday. But Sherwood's boyfriend left the lime early, and she remained with their friends. Shireen was not working. To me, she was still a child. She was full of life. She liked to explore. She liked adventure. She was a jolly person to be around. She added. Sherwood's mother died seven years ago. And she was the youngest among four siblings. The Cedros police are investigating. Penel mechanic erased in freak accident at tire shop. A 36-year-old mechanic was C R U S H E D. To death by a car during a freak accident at a tire shop in Penal on Saturday, the deceased has been identified as Shane Budu, 36, of Palmist, San Fernando, who is the father of three children, ages three, seven, and nine. Budu, who was self-employed, had rented a space at Chatu's Tire Shop, Sign Village, Penal, to do his jobs. A few days ago, a customer brought in a Toyota Corolla for him to work on. It reported that he was working under the vehicle, which was elevated off the ground. The jacks tilted, and the car fell on his chest and head. According to a police report, around 6 p.m., an air condition technician came to the shop to fix the air conditioning in Budu's vehicle. After several calls to Budu's phone went unanswered. He decided to leave. Upon leaving, he noticed that Budu was pinned under the front right side of the vehicle. He said he raised an alarm, and another man came to assist him in removing the vehicle off Budu. However, by the time they raised the vehicle off of Budu using a trolley jack, Budu had already succumbed to his injuries. When the police arrived, they noticed that the jacks under the Corolla were tilted. Budu's body had no cuts or bruises, the police said. Budu's body was taken to the mortuary at the San Fernando General Hospital for a post-mortem this week. The Superior Police are investigating. Faisabad parents lose second baby in two years. The demise of their nine-month-old baby girl is the second loss of a child that Faisabad couple Samantha Sinanan and Christopher Ramsarub have experienced in the past two years. Looking dazed yesterday at her Faisabad home, twenty-three-year-old Sinanan said it was a difficult time for the entire family. Sinanan's common-law husband, an electrician. Was out making preparations for the second night of the wake. She explained that around 3 a.m. she fed her daughter Sarah Ramsarup and put her on the bed to sleep. 
There is only one room in their humble home at St. John Branch Trace Advocate, and baby Sarah slept between her parents. According to a police report, her husband got up at 8.17 a.m. on Saturday and noticed that baby Sarah was cold and unresponsive. She was lying on her belly. Sidonan was already up and preparing a bottle for Sarah when her husband told her that the baby was still asleep and she needed to come and see what was going on. Sidonan said she finished the bottle and then went to pick up the baby, but she noticed that her daughter's hand was stiff and her body was cold. I say that was the end of it, she said. When I realized the baby was not alive, he ran up the hill and he called him mom, and everybody come down to see what was going on, because it was like a shocking thing to know that this common happened so soon, because she was so healthy and strong. She said Sarai's passing has left an emptiness in their home and lives. Everything we're missing, because every morning six o'clock she is go up the hill. I does miss how she does call mama and dada. She said her death also brought back devastating memories of when she lost her baby boy Callum back in February 2020. She had him at the San Fernando General Hospital, but he was still born. It hard, it really hard, said a soft-spoken synonym. She said she was excited about her baby's first birthday on August 6. I had real plans for my daughter, she said. An autopsy is expected to be done this week at the mortuary at the San Fernando General Hospital. Officers of the Orapuchi Police Station are investigating. Sudden Infant Death Syndrome, SIDS, is the unexplained death, usually during sleep, of a seemingly healthy baby less than a year old. SIDS is sometimes known as crib death, because the infants often die in their cribs. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley calls on public servants to not overreact and shut down the country. Prime Minister Dr. Keith Rowley has called on public servants to not overreact and not shut down the country, over a 2% offer by the Chief Personnel Officer for the last eight years. The call for a shutdown has been made by trade unions. Speaking to the media on his return from Guyana yesterday, Dr. Rowley said it was not financially feasible to give employees more than what is being offered, even in the face of the unexpected improvement in the country's economic standing. Try and not get derailed by wanting more from less. We have a little bit more now, and therefore a little bit more can provide a little bit more. A little bit more can't provide all that you require, he said. We would love to give the public servants as much as they can expect, but it has to be tempered by what reality is. Based on the information provided by the Minister of Finance, Dr. Rowley broke down the cost to the state to settle the negotiations. At the current offer, he said it will cost the state over $1 billion added to the current $8.7 billion public servant wage bill. At a 2% increase covering the period going back to 2014 to 2020, would see an additional cost on the recurring of $175 million. That's only on salary and wage in COLA. A billion dollars, and that's the payback, and then a monthly increase in $411 million going forward, he said. At a 4% increase, payback will cost $1.8 billion and a running cost increase of $588 million. And if you hear anybody talking about 10 and 15%, right? At 10%, we'll be talking about a payback of $4.5 billion and an increased running cost of $1.1 billion, he said. Now you put that against the recent report of a slight increase in the revenues from the Minister of Finance, against the background of the huge debt that we had run up for COVID and pre-COVID, put them all together, and then you come to a conclusion as to whether shutting down the country or not is the appropriate response to these circumstances. He also said the current high price of oil should not influence people's demand for a larger increase in salaries. 
Do not for one minute be guided by the fact that oil price is 100 US dollars per barrel because the oil market overnight could change and therefore if we commit ourselves to making payments based on what prevails now and in three months or two months or six months the price drops to 60 or 50 we would have worsened our position he said reason is required and patience is an essential ingredient i think you would want us to continue keeping people in jobs You'd want us to continue looking for the opportunity to provide you with an improved payment. But let us not get too carried away on this, Dr. Rowley said. Woman files lawsuit claiming cops and courts failed her daughter. The mother of a domestic violence victim who was erased five years ago by an abusive, jealous, possessive ex-boyfriend after failed attempts to get help from the police and the judiciary has filed a novel lawsuit seeking to get justice for her daughter and to ensure that this never happens to anyone in this country again. To date, the state has not responded to the claims made by Todd Lampkin, 58, of Upper Lanais Mitten Road, Carinage. The legal action comes on the heels of recent incidents of domestic violence where three women and a 12-year-old boy, Abio Cujo and her son, Levi Lewis, Stephanie Calbio and Krishana Mohammed were erased and their relatives have claimed neglect of duty by the police to take action against the offenders which could have prevented their deaths. The Police Complaints Authority, PCA, has commenced separate investigations in those matters and can make recommendations to the Commissioner of Police to take disciplinary action against officers if there is evidence to support the claims. Lampkin wants the High Court to rule on several declarations which claim Samantha Stacy Isaac's constitutional rights were infringed by the failure of state agents to act which deprived her daughter of the right to life, security of the person and equality before the law. The lawsuit also seeks declarations that Isaacs was subjected to cruel and unusual treatment without respect for her family life without equality of treatment from public authorities and the actions of the state agents amounted to discriminatory treatment. The lawsuit, which was filed on September 21, 2021, is scheduled to come up for hearing before Justice Robin Mohammed at the Hall of Justice in Port of Spain on May 24. The Office of the Attorney General, which represents both the police service and the judiciary has requested more time to respond to the claims after missing court deadlines on three occasions. The case, if successful, can open the way for other victims of domestic violence to take action against the state and get compensation for the failure of law enforcement and judicial authorities to take action to protect victims. Senior counsel Douglas Mendez leads Clay Hackett for Lampkin, while Fayard Hossein, SC, and Rishi Das are representing the state. On Friday, Lampkin said goodbye to her son, who recently died in a boating accident. To support her claims, Lampkin has produced receipts of police complaints, transcripts of hearings before two magistrates, and a detailed account of the torturous life her 26-year-old daughter lived before she was SHOT in both legs and behind the head by Karim Garcia on December 16, 2017, and left on the roadway in Carnage. Before she died, she named her attacker. Garcia, 31, fatally SHOT himself as police moved to arrest him that same day. On the same day of her demise, Isaacs had reported to the St. Clair Police that Garcia had ASSAULTED her while he was taking her to work. Isaacs had reported she was repeatedly BEATEN, ATTACKED with a KNIFE, while Garcia had a GUN. Harassed at her workplace, humiliated after he shared her NUDE images, 
and threatened to be K I L L E D in the presence of officers, and yet no action was taken. In court transcripts, she pleaded with the magistrate to grant her a protection order, and although Garcia agreed to stay away, the magistrate refused to grant the order, saying Isaacs was using that as a ploy to get maintenance for her infant son. In one hearing, the magistrate dismissed her application seeking a protection order after the matter was stood down for just 22 seconds. In December 2011, Isaacs, a UWI student pursuing a degree in biochemistry, met Garcia, an offshore worker, at a Christmas party. Garcia, the son of union leader Michael Anisset, lived with his grandmother Dulce Garcia at Point Cumana, but was ejected from the home after Garcia, T H R E A T E N E D, the woman. She had to get a restraining order. Against her grandson because of his unruly behavior and T H R E A T S. Lampkin said Garcia began to visit her daughter often, and stayed overnight at times. But she was turned off by his attitude and obscenities, and warned her daughter about his behavior. She said in the early part of the relationship, her daughter, who lived in the apartment below hers. Would be heard crying after arguments with Garcia, who accused her of being unfaithful, and he demanded to go through her phone, checking call logs and messages. The woman said she witnessed Garcia physically and verbally, a s s a u l t i n g her daughter, in full view of her daughter's father, siblings, and friends, and Garcia did not seem to care what the family thought about this behavior, and often boasted that he was not afraid of anyone, including the police. Lampkin said, as the relationship continued, she often had to intervene to protect her daughter from blows and shrugged off death. T H R E A T S from Garcia. The abuse became untenable on May twenty one, twenty thirteen, and Isaacs made her first official report to the police after Garcia smashed her cell phone because she had not answered him while at school. He had called her over one hundred times instead of investigating Isaacs' criminal complaint of malicious damage. The police instructed him to reimburse the cost to replace the phone. Lampkin said she again warned her daughter to end the relationship, but she did not. Isaacs became pregnant in August 2013, forcing her to drop out of university to get a job at Digicel as a customer service representative, to be able to take care of her pregnancy needs and care for her unborn child. Even during her pregnancy, Isaacs was a s s a u l t e d by Garcia. And Lamkin had to intervene in one instance where Garcia held a knife to her daughter's neck, accusing her of not answering her cell phone when he called. She said during the entire history of Garcia's violent conduct, the police never visited, questioned, nor arrested him about the reports made by her daughter and herself. The PCA has recommended disciplinary action against one officer at the Coronado Station for neglect of duty to investigate a complaint of malicious damage made by Isaacs on May twelfth, twenty thirteen, after Garcia had smashed her cell phone. After an investigation, the Police Complaints Division subsequently found no evidence to support the PCA's recommendation. What's your verdict? Do you believe the police's failure to investigate was because Karim Garcia was above the law due to his father's position, or do you believe their failure was due to incompetence?